City council members have announced their plan to disband the Minneapolis Police Department. We're calling for defunding the police. Shootings in New York City have more than doubled this year. Thursday is Com Center with me, Jonathan Bates. I am the dispatcher here sitting in on the show tonight. Uh, this is uh, Drew Breezy, who has the show named after him. Drew, how the heck are you? You're looking better. Did you finally get over your illness? No, I don't think I got over the illness. Like we're, it's going to be, uh, it's going to make people sick and tired of hearing how sick and tired I am. But uh, we actually got the throat culture back, and there was uh, some mysterious. Uh, bacteria at an abnormal level so we're on uh, high doses of um antibiotics it's always bad when when the guy walks back in in the hazmat suit and hands the culture back to you and it, <laughs> if the uh, patient care if the bedside manner were that uh attentive i think i would have been happy with that but no they weren't uh, i i just got a phone call from some assistant that was like uh, we called in a prescription for you you have a okay, you have you. you have an unusual disease called Andrew Baxter syndrome. <laughs> ah, shit! What are the odds of that? <laughs> right, at least it's okay. not Lou Gehrig's disease. He's, yes, you, you, the you, irony of him dying of Lou Gehrig's disease was. <clears throat> you you're actually way more lucky than him, despite what he thinks. Um, today, so, day, day is the worst but, day, day, day. <laughs> To do the I, podcast with John, John, John. I saw that uh, that skit on SNL where it's just Lou Gehrig. He's, I think it's Norm Macdonald where he's being Lou, Lou Gehrig. He's just, just like, could you believe this? You know, I have to die of this disease. I am so unlucky. I was Maybe. being sarcastic the whole time. <laughs> Figured the odds. Before the show, oh. Drew and I were reflecting on kind of how far we've come as a podcast because we were feeling good before the show started. And we were thinking about how many countless times it has not been the case where you know, episode two, Drew was flying on an airplane that was being struck by lightning. <laughs> or like yep, episode 14, where I had just been in a in a brutal car accident in Literally. which I am I am still suffering emotionally and mentally. Uh, but we're feeling pretty good. We're feeling pretty loose, uh, which means uh, since you're a 911 dispatcher and if you're feeling good, that means we've got to bring down the house with some real world sadness. And that's what we do on, on Failure to Stop Cobb Center uh, is that... Uh, we take on the realities of what 911 dispatchers deal with, and it's often very funny, and it's often soul-crushing, but we're going to laugh John, the entire time. Please discuss You're... the conversation that we had, <clears throat> uh, where I taught you a life lesson, like uh, my young boo-boo. Uh, do you remember anything about I that? don't remember you ever teaching me yeah. a life lesson. I remember you calling <laughs> right. me a dummy before the show. <laughs> yeah, I literally called you a dummy, and that was the only thing you hear, heard out of that whole paragraph. Well, the, the, we were having technical was, difficulties. That's why I heard you. Heard you call there were 300 dummy. words in that paragraph, and uh, poor Jonathan only heard one of them, and that was dummy. Um, <clears throat> no, essentially, John was, uh, and he's right. We we we're discussing the format of the show in the sense that uh, we don't mean to bring everybody down, but you know, it is kind of like the big picture of being in the communication center. Uh, because you just get hammered with sadness after sadness after sadness. Uh, fortunately for everybody in uh, internet land right now, you can turn the channel, meaning, um, you know, I, we're just trying to demonstrate that it's not easy for the 911 dispatcher because they can't turn the channel. So oh. the, we're, this is more of an ode to them. So what we were discussing kind of was like, you know, at some point we got to just throw in something happy. You know, like maybe we can throw in something happy. And I had to correct John and say, no, it is our job to spread sadness and despair throughout the world. And and we will not stop until everybody is sad and traumatized. And uh, tonight is no exception, John. You, you think he's joking. I literally had like the worst week. And today was the best day because nothing happened. It wasn't a good day because like I saved someone's life or I helped someone. Just nothing happened. And all week long, it was just like, man, I can't believe I had to do some real dispatch shit this week. And then the next day, it was like, oh, man, two days in a row. And then like by Wednesday, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, I can barely stand this. How am I going to face tomorrow? So, you know, you know, it's just funny that uh, you, you're completely overwhelmed by sadness. And, and every week, our show is kind of like that. But that's just what it's like to be an I one dispatcher. So obviously, we're doing it intentionally. Yes. Yeah, uh, we're trying to bring the world down. 
Speaking of terrible things, what's in the news? Uh, did you want me to cover the news, or I I want you to be aggressive, be be aggressive. With All right. This story. Uh, I'm going to throw up a picture. If you're listening later, then I'm sorry you won't be able to see it. But uh, as you guys may know, there is a war on police officers in this country. I am talking, of course, about the bees. Bees are after the police officers of this country. On the screen is a Los Angeles volunteer police officer who was attacked earlier this week by a swarm of fucking bees. Uh, Drew, did you have the clip of that? Yeah, no audio to it, so don't panic. But um, we'll narrate. I, I do it like it. Like, no, hold on a second. I think I like that subtitle, though. It said, uh, "You know, hopefully this guy's all right." But it says uh, he's desperately trying to swat him away. The bees so, are all over. Look him. at that. It, it was caught on live TV. Apparently, this poor guy, man. Look at him. I, you know, it's just all these bees. He's just try, trying to swat them away, and they're hungry for blue blood. They got a taste of it. They must have stung a cop earlier that week. Oh, he completely God. face plants and it looks absolutely horrible. They're they're actually dispatching paramedics to him. It says the, the captioning say it's a scene from a horror movie. They're absolutely right. I know I've seen this on like season five of the X Files or the uh, that girl with or that movie with Macaulay Culkin where he gets killed by the bees. Uh, the reason why this is important to me is because I've been at war with the bees ever since I was a little boy. I was swarmed by a a, a vicious cloud of mud daubers after I innocently stepped on their domicile, which they make in Ooh. the earth. And they, they swarmed all over me. And because my parents didn't super love me a lot, a neighbor had to come out and was uh, brushing the bees off of my face. And I convalesced at her house for, you know, some unknown amount of time. And of course, we all know that, well, those bees that stung me died, you know, in the last century. But bees can communicate. They have communal memory. They they pass down in an oral tradition of bee dancing the tales of me. And so the bees are still sort of at war with me to this day. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna dispel some rumors ab about bees because when I have come out against the bees, I basically will say that you're either with me or you're with the bees. Like that's the state that we're at with the with the bees. And I, when I tell this to people, they're like, oh no, bees are what enable our plants to have sex with each other, and we need them to to do all this and we need them for honey and all this. Like, first of all, if you are a true ecologist, you will know that all species of bee are invasive to North America. We brought them over with us from Europe, from Europe as another form of scourge to the indigenous peoples here. It uh, is, uh, it's why they call them colonies, by the way. They're exactly, these are that's, colonizers. It's, it's exactly why colonization was bad. It's exactly like the bees. So, so some helpful tips about bees. Bees are vertebrates. They produce milk to feed their young. They are born alive. They possess a fully formed neocortex fur. They have three bones in their ears. They're intelligent. They're self-aware. They could use tools. They socialize. They can communicate. They have a complex organized society, which outnumbers ours by many magnitudes. And their ongoing obsession of their brainless lives is just murder or suicide of human beings and especially police officers. And it is only happenstance of nature that they're ill-equipped to fulfill their sinister final destiny and also just fuck they're scary and i just am so sick of the bees and the bees are back around here and uh just death to the bees like i said you're either with me or you're with them and i i implore you to make the right decision because they're coming after the cops now do you know which member of the team is uh, highly allergic to bees is it you? It seems like you have a fairly weak constitution, and so bee allergies would be something that you would possess. I hate to, I hate to do this to you, but bees nuts. Okay, oh. we're gonna play the we're gonna play the voicemails first. Yeah, let's play some because fun voicemails because I just went <laughs> off on a ten minute tirade about bees. No, it's gonna be heavy for the rest of the show. Trust me. Uh, looking forward to uh, to oh. hey boys, keeper from one more, and I'm out of here. Just want to say thanks for uh, having me on last week. Uh, looking forward to uh, tonight's show. Can't wait to hear what you're going to throw at us. But uh, like I said, appreciate you and uh, all the help you guys have given us. And uh, hope you have a great show tonight. See ya. So that's Chief Keith calling to uh, wish us, uh, telling us to break a leg, which I appreciate. Uh, if you want to participate in this fun of uh, of calling us, leaving us a voicemail, or even calling live, for God's sakes. You can call, you can get a hold of us at 848-COM-911. That's very clever. But that's also uh, the numbers, 848-266-6911.
Nice. nice. Okay, I'm seeing some pushback in the chats. They're saying, well, you don't need to worry about hornets and wasps. I will tell you, first of all, all bees are the same. And okay, so you're going to tell me that almost there's almost 100 different kinds of insects on Earth, and, and over a third of them are bees. And you want to say that this isn't like a complex ongoing thing? The government knows about this. Why do you think that we have beekeepers? Oh, good point. Good point. Right. Go on. Oh, the the next, I was listening oh, okay. to Kiefer. Are the are the boy are the beekeepers like the oath keepers? Are they a, 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 sub, a far right group? Okay, here we go. Hey, consider not a law enforcement officer, but a former marine, and you know, I just seem to think that society is going extremely well. I don't know why you guys need to have the comm center. To tell us that it's not going extremely well. All right, guys, that's the end of us. Um, yeah, we'll just put it on pause until things aren't going as well. Um, I, apparently, I'm pretty sure that was an aborted call. <laughs> Either he gets us or he doesn't, and that's. I, that's I think I even point. promised him we wouldn't play it, and then I forgot. <laughs> uh, as the French say, uh, chacun a, ch a son goût, Ch 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 which is uh, to which... each his own. Here's the last uh, voicemail. Hey, John, this is Thad. I just wanted to tell you you were doing an awesome job on Failure to Stop Com Center and that your beard is epic. Oh, Yes, this is so awesome because last week I had some kid telling me that our show's boring because all we do is talk. And like today, like he definitely has a point because we're at like almost 23 minutes and all we've done is talk and we've not educated. God forbid we talk on a podcast. But yes. So let me, let me ask you this. Uh, how many calls like that of me have you not sent me to, to download? All right, we're going to move on. I obviously uh, send you all of them if, we send, if we're getting ones where people are like, I don't think we need Cobb Center. <laughs> And then obviously sent you every single message we get. Where it's like a guy took an ambient and he, did, he doesn't like our show. And so he called us. That was literally what we did. All right. It's time to get heavy. Put your game faces on. And I, I'm not like, listen, we, we say this all the time. We, we talk, we not quasi joke, but like we say, look, we're, we're going to interject some very um, kind of uh, quippy or humorous things into a very desperate situation this is no exception tonight I, i'm not going to attempt to be witty or funny during this thing it is going to get very heavy and i'm telling you this uh and, and i do mean that that's that's what we were trying to do is kind of convey the fact that the dispatchers don't have the choice so though you do and i appreciate you hanging in here and I, i'm sure john does and that first marine doesn't but um <clears throat> speaking of marines uh I want to play something for you to kind of set the tone for tonight because it deals with military first responder and uh, medical professionals and their mental health. And it deals with the fact that the system is broken, but it's a, it's a gut wrenching plea from a, a member of our military. Seven times, seven times over the course of <laughs> the last fucking six years, dude, the VA has continued to let me down. Fuck. I just want some fucking continuity and care with mental health providers. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> These doctors keep quitting. They keep switching. And then the one doctor that I really liked, who talked me off a fucking ledge the last time, <laughs> <laughs> refused. <laughs> I had a split because they fell out of network and then they came back in the network. So I went the last two years dealing with my own demons myself <laughs> and trying to hold it to fucking together. <laughs> and then come to find out it's like, it's like May, May, it's like late May. And he denied, he denied taking my case back April fucking 12th. And I'm just finding out, dude. And now I gotta go back to some new fucking doctor. <laughs> and then I gotta open fucking Pandora's box again because they're gonna wanna know everything and then I'm gonna have to live through work and do that for a fucking month. <laughs> I just wanna... I just want some fucking continuity and care, dude. I'm fucking so tired of it. 
I just want to be able to talk to the same fucking person and have the same individual manage my goddamn meds. Been the, off my off all my medications for fucking two years. I've been doing it on my own, man. I'm just fucking white knuckled. I'm gripping. Jesus fuck! I'm so tired. Of it. It's not a lot to ask. I just want to be able to talk to the same person and not continue to have to retell these fucking stories that torment me. <laughs> I, I fucking get it now. I really do. Fuck. I, I get it. <laughs> Dr. Bennett McAllister in Port Charlotte. <laughs> fucking. <laughs> just, and it wasn't even him, it was his PA that I really liked, dude. I like. He taught me how to fucking laugh, dude. <laughs> I just want some continuity of fucking care. All right, so very heavy stuff. And and uh, look, you know, uh, I, 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 let, let me just throw a few observations your way, John. And I Like, you, you don't even need to opine if you don't want, but that's a fucking man's man. And he is reduced to a slobbering, snotty mess on the side of the road. Yeah, his, his hands are quivering, and his you can tell his he's, body is quivering. He's at he's at the end of himself, and uh, honestly, my impression of it, and I'll let you take take this, Drew, because like you you were in the Air Force, but uh, him can, pouring this out for this camera is probably the best therapy that he's gotten in a long time. Um, and this is it. This is as good as it has gotten for him. Is just explaining how bad his care has been. Go it's ahead. a, pl- but it's true. It, I see it truly as a plea. Like, so, you know, where this guy probably, I don't, I, I can't say probably. There are a lot of people in, in the first responder profession, and there are definitely a lot of people in the military profession that, you know, will throw around terms like, just suck it up or don't be a pussy or, um, because it doesn't, trauma doesn't affect people the same way. And, and it doesn't, you don't have to, you know, what's catastrophic to one person doesn't mean it's not catastrophic to another person. And we're talking about your brains. We're talking about like, this is how your, your, your nerves work. Or, I mean, literally John pointed out that his hands were shaking. His whole body was shaking. I mean, you know, he's a, he's a tough dude. He's a, obviously he's in the gym a little bit, but you saw that self touch gesture where he's right in the middle of talking and he starts spinning his ring. He's, which to me is encouraging. He's, he's thinking about his wife or he, he's thinking about like, you know, this is soothing to me, whether he knows it or not. Yeah. And <clears throat> he's not asking for much. And, and this has been the lament. I, I can tell you as far back as, you know, my mother is uh, May 23rd is going to be 92 years old. Her, her older brother uh, was uh, all of her brothers were in the war, uh, bad alcoholics usually. Uh, two of the three of them, at least. Uh, one of them had both of his legs removed. So, I mean, for the rest of you know his adult life, he just sat in a wheelchair. Uh, he had had several strokes, so you know he just sat in a wheelchair and drank beer all day, just like born on the Fourth of July. Except he was really old, you know, to, you know, to me. But uh, a product of the VA. It's just another. Th- this has been going on for centuries, and this is not like when you go into the comments of that thing on Tom DeBlas's page. It, it gets into like, well, thank you, President Trump, for, you know, and then it turns into Republican and Democrat. This guy doesn't want to hear fucking Republican and Democrat, and I don't want to hear it either. This guy wants continuity of care. He wants the, the ability to see the same doctor because, like he's saying, it's not about being a fucking prima donna here. He just doesn't want to have to reopen old wounds. He wants to tell the story once and get better. And he's going through the motions. And, you know, I used to teach in the academy all the time. Like, we don't have patients as cops sometimes. So, you know, we're dealing with a whole population that has returned from war. So in driving down the street, you see that red pickup truck at 2 in the morning. And a bag starts tumbling across the street, rolling across the street in the wind, like a, a plastic shopping bag or whatever. And they jerk the wheel. They're they're just freaked out. They're they're just a little like jumpy or edgy, and you don't know, you know, obviously that. But you pull the guy over, and he, if he gives you that as a reason, you might 
want to start taking that at face value instead of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me your license and registration. Uh, have you been drinking tonight? Or because that sets off a, a whole fucking measure of um, like just PTSD, like um, tunnel vision. Like I, I saw a guy melt down over a simple like fender bender. Neither fender was bent by the way, but he was just so angry. And so just because the person that he bumped into, by the way, was from somewhere else. So he, he resented her being here. Uh, I, you know, I put my life on the line for this country and blah, blah, blah. And he was inconsolable and just so fucking angry and ready to punch anybody. And you just couldn't break through. And I just see that cement. I see that cement around him. I see that cement around that guy that we just saw in the video. I see that cement around so many first responders that are like, I'm okay. I just need to fucking, I just need to slow down on the drinking a little bit. Yeah, she kicked me out again, but everything's going to be okay. It's probably not going to be okay until you get it addressed. And we can't get it addressed until we get proper care. And it's bleeding over into our profession because it's all privatized for us. Unfortunately, the VA is a mess, and hopefully we'll get it straightened out. Now, I'm saying all of that as the setup to tonight's story. I don't want you to think or look at this as just another police shooting, just another uh, guy with a gun taking somebody hostage. Um, and I also want you to keep in mind, when we have things like veteran court or drug court uh, for people who are, you know, they need specialized care. They need specialized attention. It's it's not necessarily them being a criminal. It's not the, it's not their soul talking. It, it, their soul was lost in the war. It's whatever has come back that's doing the talking. That's that's taking the drugs. That's taking the you know the drinking too much or whatever. And this is in part in tribute to one of our own staff members who. You know, without putting all of his business on the streets, he just put it up on the screen. One of our own guys has lost faith in the VA, and, and he's in a tremendous amount of pain constantly. He doesn't sleep normal, um, you know, whatever normal is. But so with that in mind, that's why I'm painting the picture of, of what we're going to share tonight. Um, John, do you have anything before I read kind of the story of what happened? Yeah, I just uh, for those of us that were not in the armed forces, I, I want to encourage you to watch. There's a video on YouTube with Kevin Smith, who's from clerks and he's a director and he's a comic book guy. And I've been, been very prolific over the years, but he released a video recently and I had the pleasure of watching it. It's about half an hour long and I encourage you to watch the entire thing, but he talks about what trauma really is. And if you're not in the military and you feel like, well, I can't relate to these guys at the VA, just know that this is kind of how he discusses it and I'll be brief, but basically you've got a part of your brain called the amygdala. It's your, uh, the reptile part of your brain is your fight, flight, freeze part of your, part of your brain. And all that is, is like an on off switch for responding to trauma about whether or not you're protecting yourself, you know, through one of those methods and how, uh, he went through some traumatic experiences in his life, uh, that I think every single person can relate to because he's been through some stuff that most people have been through. But, uh, he says, you know, this, this is how this changed me. This is how it affected me. And this is how it eventually got me to this very, very bad place in my life. And so I encourage you to look that up on YouTube. Like I said, you guys have dispatcher skills. You can just go seek that out for yourself. But if you want to know what trauma is and how trauma works, and, uh, I encourage you to watch it because I'm one of these guys where, you know, like I have to deal with stuff at my job. And one of the ways that I deal with that is by minimizing. And I say the stuff that doesn't happen to me is a big deal. And very recently, even even this year, I'm just like, you know, I get so sick of everyone describing everything that goes they go through as trauma because it seems like everyone's a victim. So no one's a victim. Well, that's obviously that's what happens when everyone in our society claims victim status. Right. It, it distracts from people that actually have real problems. So but when uh, you go through something in your life that activates, you know, that part of your brain and you go into that defense mode, fight, flight, freeze or whatever. Uh, then you're experiencing trauma. And it doesn't matter if you're being called a bad name in a, in a social situation or if you're getting blown up in Baghdad. I mean, uh, your brain your brain just responds to trauma. And so even if you're if you're dealing with something and you think like, gosh, I don't have it as bad as as these Marines, as these soldiers, as these airmen, uh, just know that uh, 
you know, maybe you just need to worry about what's going on with you and take care of yourself. But uh, I have gone on too long about this, but look for that Kevin Smith video because it will completely change the way that you think about trauma and the way that you think about uh, mental health care. And it was uh, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, video that he put on. Drew, go ahead and uh, let's start talking about tonight's case. Yeah, we can. I, I just want to add real quick, the uh, you all know I'm a big, huge fan of Dexter Pitts. I have Dexter Pitts pajamas that I wear to bed often. Um, and he was in a uh, very poignant documentary on HBO before he was, you know, before he was part of this family, so to speak. I mean, um, and it was it was produced and kind of narrated by James Gandolfini, who played Tony Soprano. And Dexter talks about a lot, a lot in this book. And uh, I remember watching that before I even knew what, you know, like who Dexter was or and, you know, it's a surreal moment getting to meet the guy. But. Um, just, just bear this in mind. Um, and when you're having these conversations at the dinner table, at the Thanksgiving table, like I talked about earlier, um, some of these guys are dealing with either police trauma, firefighter trauma, whatever, or war trauma, and then police trauma on, uh, on top of that. And what, what Jonathan was just talking about in the Kevin Smith doc was the, the reptilian brain, the fight or flight response. And what your fight or flight is trying to do is prevent you from being re-traumatized. That's all it's doing. It's, it's, so when anybody tells you that the cop had an itchy trigger finger or that they, uh, you know, they got tunnel vision very quickly or whatever, this is a product of that. And this is why I think it is so important that we talk about this. Like this is for the profession, for the good of the profession and for the good of the community, for them to understand that, we're not just out there hunting people down. Um, that's a foolish notion. And if, hunting people down by the color of their skin is an even more foolish notion. But a lot of this is trauma response. And let's be frank, we, we, can't, we can't have it both ways. So a lot of this black on black crime that we talk about or crime in the inner city is emotional trauma response as well. It's the same mental health system. And it's the same brain. It's the same lizard brain. So with that, let's, let me just talk about what, uh, what this guy, what was behind this guy. Uh, the, the title of this family, uh, it's an article on Yahoo, family, a man who Stockton police shot ki and killed, said he was a veteran and he had mental health struggles. So my heart goes out to this family. My heart goes out to the baby girl that he had, um, that he left behind. Uh, let me see if I can find her. I know I have her somewhere. Um, so this is him. Um, my heart goes out to his mom and dad and stepdad. Like he, he had brothers and sisters, I'm sure, or whatever. And, and, you know, everybody around him that loved him, his wife. And um, so we're not doing this from an exploitive purpose. It's we're doing this to open the conversation up a little bit wider, maybe. Uh, but in 2012, he was um, bunkmates with a guy named Tyler Baxter, of all things. That's my actual last name. And uh, they were army combat engineers. They were good friends. They were bunkmates, and they weren't speaking. They were uh, they were deployed together, but they had a they had a brouhaha. They had a little brawl. Um, so <laughs> they had a fight, you know, the night before. I, I'm sure uh, I've never been. I, I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've been to Egypt and Jordan, but I'd never been part of Desert Shield or Desert Storm. I had never been deployed. Uh, things get, you know, a little cramped uh when you're overseas like that and uh tempers flare and things happen um but after six months of uh, bunking together in a tiny room they had grown sick of each other and they fought uh they fought boots and fists were thrown uh and neither would budge but uh, at one point during a mission he was on foot in an area where a roadside bomb had just exploded and he couldn't see or hear any uh, an approaching platoon and so desperate to catch his friend's attention before another potential blast, Baxter threw a water bottle at Alta Murano and signaled, get back in the vehicle. And just as he got back in the car, a thing blew up, an, an IED blew up. Um, and he said, uh, Alta Murano walked up, and he, he give him, gives me this pissed off looking face and he goes, thanks, brother. So this is not somebody that wanted to die. He was over in sacrifice of our country. And he didn't want to die. He was thankful that he didn't die. He was saved by, by his buddy. Well, we fast forward to, uh, uh, to a couple of years later. And we're talking about January 10th at about 4.17 in the morning. And we're going to hear the chilling 
911 calls of the people involved, and we're going to hear his desperate 911 call. Um, the the shooting in this one, and you know that's how it ended, um, is not as graphic as as they normally are, but it's probably 12 or 14 times more intense than they normally are. So let me just read what the screen says as it says it. And, um, we'll continue that way. But on January 10th at uh, 417, a citizen called the Stockton Police Department and reported um, that there was a man with a gun in the 3300 block of West Hammer Lane. And shortly after the suspect, later identified as Rico Ruiz Altamiro, called the Stockton Police Department saying he was armed with a firearm. He actually made a call. He then showed an employee of a nearby uh, store his gun and told the employee that he was going to take him hostage. Now, to the casual observer, you're like, okay, this guy's a criminal, blah, blah, blah. But wait, like, give it a minute. You know, as officers arrived, they saw Rico outside armed with a firearm. He was wearing body armor. So, again, another indicator that, okay, this guy maybe is a bad guy because he's holding a gun and he's got body armor on, which is a protective measure, right? So you don't die. So <clears throat> crisis negotiators began talking with him. They tried to get him to put the gun down. And at one point he took off his body armor and he told the officers to take his life while he was still holding onto the gun. You'll see he was holding the gun to his head. Uh, an uninvolved motorist drove down the parking lot uh, and Rico walked towards the vehicle pointing the handgun at the motorist. This is probably the saddest, uh, he, that, that motorist is probably the luckiest uh, guy on the planet, but it's actually probably one of the saddest things I've ever seen because um, it, it, you not, definitely not to Monday morning quarterback anybody, but would it, would it have been avoidable if they had blocked the back entrance off or, you know, just a few questions, but it, it, it however it happened, it happened. And uh, five Stockton police officers ended up firing their weapons and they struck Rico uh, they administered first aid. Uh, they tried life-saving measures right there, but he died at the scene. There were no injuries to any officers or any of the citizens, but he did die while he was there. So they uh, <clears throat> initiated a multi-agency critical incident investigation. Uh, the investigators from San Joaquin County District Attorney's Office, the Bureau of Investigations, uh, the California Department of Justice, and the San Joaquin County Medical Examiner's Office all joined together. Um, and they investigated this thing to make sure that um, th it was a justified shooting. Um, justified in this case is heart wrenching, is gut wrenching. This is what was recovered at the scene. It's a picture of a 40 uh, caliber Glock and some body armor. The, the Velcro is ripped like he took it off. So you're about to hear excerpts from 911 callers. What we, you know, John uh, pointed out to me before we even went on the air there is a suicide hotline known as 911. Eight, eight. If you're feeling any kind of uh, suicidal thought or you just need somebody to talk to, it's it, it, there is no shame in the game. Um, I've dealt with somebody recently who was ashamed of like crying because that's not how they are. Um, uh, how else are you going to get that bucket in your heart to dump out? You, you got to let it dump out sometimes. And calling a suicide hotline is not mean. Uh, you, you don't qualify if you're not suicidal. You can still call. Uh, here in the Tampa Bay area, we have something uh, known as 211, um, which is the Crisis Center Hotline. It's the greatest resource for cops. It's the greatest resource for any civilian going through a crisis. Um, but I would encourage you to call that. There's a national uh, law enforcement hotline as well. A blue by, all, crisis by, all, by all means, call before you're, you're, you get to that point. If you're thinking about harming yourself, if, you, if you're thinking anything like, you know, it would hurt less to be dead, if you're thinking anything like that, don't wait until the gun's in your hand. Don't wait until you're already at the point of lethal means. There's a different way that we can handle this. Don't think your problems are too big. There's people that want to help you. There's people that, that care, okay? I'm one yep. of them. And don't don't wait until you get to that point, please. Yeah, and I like, and this is speculation on my, on my part, but, um, but I, I, I'll share with you freely. Um, if you've got the preconceived notion that, uh, soon I'm going to die. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die. Um, and you start to feel like you're getting shit hammered drunk. Um, I can't tell you how many Budweiser suicides I've responded to. In other words, if they had been sober, they probably would have talked themselves out of it. But the fact that they lowered their inhibitions by drinking into oblivion uh, probably helped precipitate the suicide. It made it less painful for them. And I think, I think 
that this may have had a, f- a benefactor in this uh, in this case. But you're going to hear from the 911 call. Yeah, this is emergency. Um, I'm on Hamill Lane. Uh, some guy just is on with a weapon and told me to call 911. I'm sorry? Um, I'm on Hamill Lane at Chevron, and the guy, a guy is on with a weapon. said call 911 for him. Okay, which um, Chevron are you at? On Hamill Lane by I-5. By I-5? Okay, and this person came up to you? Yes, he said call 911 and pull out his weapon. I'm about to leave right now. I'm not safe. But can you um, please send somebody? What, what type of weapon do they have? Uh, it looks like it was a, a Glock 45. Okay. And he told you to call 911? Yes, he pulled it, pulled out his weapon, said he shot with a weapon. 911, let's be out of emergency. <laughs> yeah, I need, I, I, I need you guys to come to me right now. I'm sorry? I need, I need you guys to come to me right now. Where are you at? I'm at, uh, I'm on Hammer Pass I-5 on the, uh, I'm next to the bunch of the Taco Bell and the Jack in the Box. Are you in the Jack in the Box parking lot? Um, yes. Okay. What's your name? I, you know, I just need you guys to come to me. I'm, 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 I'm on. Okay. What type of car are you in? There's 22 white Toyota Caravan. Okay. Why are you crying? What's going on? <laughs> it I just need you guys to handle me. I need you guys to come do it for me. Okay, what, what's going on? No, I need you guys to come do it for me. I can't do it myself. There's a question in the chat. So is this the same guy that was on the video earlier? And no, this is not. This is something completely separate. This happened in January. That thing, that video I showed earlier just happened the other day. Um, uh, just some observations, though. This guy, uh, I don't know if she caught it when he said it. And obviously, we catch it now because we know the outcome. But he said, I just need you to fucking come here and handle me. I can't do it myself. Which is an indicator of he wants to commit suicide by cop which is a term i cannot stand but this is exactly what this is and he uh i I think some of the red flags in this um there was a uh an incident where uh it's it talked about in the yahoo article how his wife said that he had been involved in some kind of um recent uh injury or something a head trauma and then they were kind of split he had been uh drinking more and more he was at a bar and he got a room at a budget inn which is the budget inn he just discussed and i don't know what you know is the civilian population or what but i'll tell you uh generally when people want to kill themselves they'll check into a cheap hotel to do it because they don't want to ruin their car they don't want to ruin whatever they're going to leave behind or whatever uh so suicides in hotels are a little bit more common than you would think it's just that um you know, it's probably a little bit more discreetly investigated because uh, for, you know, for some obvious reasons. John, do you have anything? The first call on there where the guy says, you know, he he says, you know, uh, there's a guy here with a gun and he's telling me to call 911. He's armed. It's so confusing to the dispatcher because it's like, well, you know, is this a robbery? Is this an active shooter? What, What the heck's going on? This is an unusual situation. You can tell she's a little bit thrown. And finally, he says, you know, I'm safe. You know, is it okay if I go? Because, like, obviously he should leave the scene. If he's safe, he should, keep, you know, keep that going. He should definitely leave the scene. Um, but what that is is that's going to hugely clue you into what happens. And this is not something that I would realize until after the fact, unfortunately. But it's just there's really only one person in danger there. E- even with knowing now how it turns out at the end, I don't believe that this guy at any point wishes harm towards anyone else. He's just creating the situation to where uh, the police can come to him. Dispatcher asks some pertinent questions. What kind of weapon does he have that's going to affect law enforcement response? If he's got a rifle, obviously that changes the entire situation. It's going to change how they can approach him, how they would do that, versus if he's got a pistol, his effective range is a lot closer. So those are just some some regular questions. But when he comes on the line and he's crying, it could be so difficult because you want to give that empathy. But you also, you don't want to sound condescending or, or overly sweet or like you're playing them. Like I've had a, a suicidal person once where I'm going through the script, and I've mentioned this on the show before, where I'm like, you know, do you have any thoughts or plans of harming yourself? And 
you know, and she, she has just been through this so many times. She goes, no, I know what you're going to ask. No, this, no, that. And, and I said, like, I can tell that, you know, this, that you've been through this a few times. And I saw on my CAD that, you know, on my computer that she has indeed called. I'm like, I'm like, you know what? It's my job to keep you on the phone and talk to you. I'm ready to listen to anything you have to tell me. I don't know anything that you're going through. But just just talk to me. You know that it, that I'm going to try to keep in the line until they get you until they get to you. I can't do anything to keep you on the line. It's entirely up to you. And sometimes by leveling with them, you can reach them. But when they're at this point, when they're crying, they're at their lowest point. And as a dispatcher, you you have no idea what the best thing to do is, and you are just struggling. And you're just hoping that the units get there in time. Drew. Sure. Um. Yeah. A great point. Uh. Uh, something to look out for in a loved one, or if you're dealing with something like that, is that, that low, you know, that low crying, that uncontrollable crying, that's, that's it. That's rock bottom. I mean, and, and we've talked about this on, um, the show before on one of the other shows, but you know, some of us have ex experienced that you, you, you just know it. Like, you, you know, it when you hear it, it's kind of like smelling a dead body for the first time. You just kind of know that, but he did say, um, it doesn't fu what he was saying is it doesn't fucking matter just get here and just like john said a second ago um trying to reason with him is not necessarily um you'll see what i mean in a second when the officers try to reason with him emergency yeah i'm holding hostage at gunpoint right now where are you at by rico okay he just said something he's where are you at Hammer Lane. Yeah. What, what? Okay, I'm gonna keep you on the line. Okay, where are you calling from? Hammer Lane. Hammer. Yeah. Apartment what? What is your name? I'm gonna keep you on the line. Okay. Mhm. Yeah. You ain't got no point now. You ain't got no point now, right? Are you guys inside? Yes, he has me hostage right now at gunpoint. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, is he on the phone with somebody? Give me a fucking bit. Hey, there it is. Hey, hey, yes. Is it the name of the business? What's the name of the business, sir? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What is it? <laughs> what? Can I back up or? Okay. Oh, there they are right there. He's, Rico sees them. I'm going to keep yeah, the line. Rico's in here. He's coming out. He's coming okay, out. Okay, he said that he's coming out. Okay, hold on, okay? Hey, um, Easy. So, she's picking up on what is being said, and she's trying to relay it. And, and John, uh, we, we've talked about this before, too, the lull of the midnight shift. And then four, this happened at 4.17 in the morning. So you're thinking in an hour and 33 minutes, I'm going home. Uh, and all of a sudden this gets thrown on your plate. And boy, are you awake at that point? Yeah, it's uh, jarring because sometimes you could be on the downward slope and you're just kind of like you're almost kneeling out the clock and the game will be over. And then all of a sudden you've lost possession of the ball. You know, it's it's a it's a crude analogy for a, a terrible feeling. But one thing I'll notice uh, is this dispatcher is typing louder and faster as the situation gets worse. And uh, that's something that I've done before, too, because her brain has just thrown it into sixth gear to try to get information out to these guys. And part of that is a sympathetic to response to she wants the units to get there faster. If she her 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 whole information gathering, processing and disseminating thing. It's all it's all a muscular thing because she's typing. And so she's actually going faster with her hands because to her, subliminally, at least on some level, if she types faster, if she speaks faster, if she comprehends faster, the units will get there faster. It's a trap that all dispatchers fall into. And it's why we feel absolutely helpless because it's like we are processing information. It's going out as fast as it's coming in and it's not fast enough for us. Drew, go ahead. But, but let's talk about that for a second. And this is why I say that dis or that's why it's proven over and over again that dispatcher trauma is no different than than any other first responder trauma because she's banging away at that keyboard louder and louder and louder because it's becoming harder and harder her, for her to see the keys because her adrenaline is spiking through the roof, which means her cortisol is shooting up, which means her sympathetic you know, nervous system is on fire, which means 
uh, her heart needs more uh, oxygen, which means she's breathing a little bit more. Like, it's no different. It's absolutely no different. The only difference is the danger, the presence of danger. And she's like, just just imagine yourself like when you were a kid, um, you know, the countdown to, to the shower. You know what I mean? Or the countdown to go take your bath. Like, okay, six, five, four, you know, that just that's that feeling you start to get into like before you have to take off running into the thing or, you know, even just watching an old episode of MacGyver, the six million dollar man where, you know, he's like sweating and he's got to cut the red wire and then he's got to cut the blue wire and it's got to get the sequence right. And um, this is a stressful, stressful, stressful moment. But your well, body and it's way more complicated than diffusing a bomb and snipping a wire. I mean, I say that not knowing anything about no, your it, life it, or ordinance disposal, but or medicine as you're, as you're listening. <laughs> Yeah, and as you're listening and you're trying to get that information out, it's so frustrating because you can process information so fast. But obviously, the stuff that you're typing that populates on the screen at, at a certain point, it's not it's not downloading into the officer's brain as fast as you're getting it in there. So and, uh, go ahead. So uh, the, my point is, like, as an officer, you know, you're going to get this adrenaline rush every time you pull somebody over. Like sometimes the hackles in the back of your neck stand up more, more than other traffic stops, but you can't see what you're getting into. And you know, you, the, the same adrenaline, the, the adrenal glands start overproducing in the whole nine yards and you get a little bit of shaky or whatever, just to keep yourself honest. Or, you know, when you're getting into a harrowing, harrowing situation, you got your gun out and you're, you're begging with somebody to drop their gun or whatever your, your heart only has so many heartbeats and and the adrenaline is speeding that heart up and and let, let's what's the difference between that and the the by the way sedentary dispatcher who's just who hasn't really moved a whole lot during the shift and all of a sudden this big adrenaline dump comes in and, and like the the adrenaline becomes a sort of poison like through their body just coursing through their veins and they're trying to keep everything straight because they don't want it. They're trying to save this guy's life. They're trying to make sure that the officers know everything that they can know. So they're not marched into their depths and they're trying to communicate with one another. And then you got somebody probably behind you yelling stuff to you to ask. And it's a very, very, very trying time. So let's uh, let's you're, we're about to see the body cam footage. Um, this one, as far as I'm concerned, the, the officer's, I think all five of them are probably like devastated that they had to do this. Uh, but I don't, I think they were put in a very bad choice here. So you're about to see the footage. This is one person. I got eyes on him. He's got a vest on. In front of a smoke shop, a it's on. it's rainy, uh, and it's dark, very dark out. But the lights of the business are on, and the lights in the plaza are on. So you got guys dressed in all black with their rifles out, kind of running He's all around, trying to get into position. But they're also trying to get a tactical edge to see to, his head. to see what they can see, uh, specifically him. He's got a gun. So now they have realized. He He's got a gun. In fact, what he was saying before all that, and I was talking over it, but he was saying it looks like he's uh, he's putting his hands on his head. It looks like he's putting his hands on his head. Then it dawns on him. Oh, my God, he's got a gun. He's got a gun. Don't do it. Keep your hands down, man. I don't want to shoot you. I don't want to shoot you. I don't want to shoot you, man. I don't want to shoot you, man. Don't do it, man! Don't do it! Don't do it! So you can hear so, him, uh, yeah, begging him. Wife. Don't! I don't want to shoot you. I don't want to shoot you. And so this is like the ultimate catch twenty-two. You know, you're responding to a guy that wants to kill himself or he wants to be killed. And because the other people are in danger, you know, you've got a responsibility. We're always talking about policing to protect the majority because that's the job of the police. And so, you now, like I said, you're in this ultimate conundrum of having to comply with what this guy wants you to do in order to protect other people. Drew, go ahead. I suspect that, you know, in, just in retrospect, he probably had the body armor on because he didn't want the he, he didn't want to be wounded. 
he wanted to be killed. So think about makes that. Sense, Here's yeah. officers, uh, officer Hooper's uh, body camera. He's officer number two. So officer Hooper is behind uh, like a metal uh, door of some sort. I don't know if their bear cat is already out there or whatever, but he's, he's holding deadly forts on the guy. He's, he's got him in his sights. He's, he's following him with his rifle and the guy is just pacing back and forth in the parking lot. You can see he's wearing khaki shorts or pants. And he's got the gun to his head, and he's got the um, uh, tactical vest on. It's green, you know, the tactical vest. Um, and they're just yelling. They're pleading with him. It, it does get confusing also because, you know, you probably got five guys trying to save this one guy's life, and you got one guy that wants to die, and they're talking over each other, and it's just it's chaos. Like, they're begging him not to do what they know he wants them to do. So here's uh, Kachalkin. Kachalkin. Yeah, Officer Ch- Kachalkin. Hey, man, listen. We're not that different, you and I, bud. We went to the same high school. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's okay, hi. I don't fucking care. I'm telling you, we're the you same. Does that mean something? What does that mean? It does mean something. It doesn't mean shit. No different than me. It doesn't mean shit. Just put it down so no, we can talk to you. We went to the same high school. We did. It's okay, high school. We played football together. Nobody cares. I care. That's why we're here. Why? Why? We're here to help you. Why? Just go to state high school. Yeah, that shows you how close we are. No, no, no. We're not close. I don't know you. I'm telling you, we're the same. Just put it down so we can talk. So he's trying to get on the level with the guy. He's trying to find something in common, and he has something in common. He played football with him in high school. But let's. this is why I said what I said earlier. You're not just reasoning with a guy who is hell-bent on dying. You are reasoning with what I would estimate to be an intoxicated guy who is hell-bent on dying. Possibly. Nothing is ever going to make sense to any – no one is going to get – through to that guy it's just it's very difficult to do unless you just by some miracle like you find a john or whatever that just happens to connect um he's he's irrational at this point and he's demonstrated that but you know the alcohol fuels it and that's why i say the budweiser suicides are probably the most heartbreaking because would they have done that if they were sober And, and again i'm speculating i don't know if he was drunk or not but well, he he could be honestly so hopeless that he's at that point too. I mean, you you could be right about the intoxication thing, but I mean, uh, you, you can you can reach the point where he's at where you don't care, and everything seems cheap to you. Like if someone says, you know, we played football together, you know, he's trying to conjure up, you know, brotherhood, camaraderie, uh, surviving tough times together, a bond, um, you know, trying to draw a likeness to him. You could be at a point where you are so disconnected from other people that, it, you know, uh, case in point, he's got this uh, beautiful daughter and where he's at in his life, he can't think about being a dad to her anymore. He's so he's so past the point where he he can't see that as a good thing. He can't see that as an option. He doesn't have that as a future. So when these guys are trying to harken back to, hey, we played football together, hey, age can just seem cheap to him he's just he just tell tells he can tell that it's a stalling tactic or whatever it is um generally time is on your side if you're negotiating with someone you're kind of hoping that their emotional high comes down that they can regain their equilibrium we've talked about that a few times on the show but i believe that you can be so despondent that you just don't give a shit about anything and i i think i think that's possibly the heart of suicide drew go ahead i i think you're right about that i i mean i i just i I happen to think he's irrational and unreasonable because he might be intoxicated. Just something I read earlier that led me to believe that. Officer Grauman here, body cam four. So they're discussing a plan. They're talking about the shield and getting it up to the window. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, so what you can't see if you're listening to this is off to the left. The, the, the officers are in a stack on the driver's side of a car. One is using the, the engine block as kind of the, you know, so they have the door open. One's using the engine block as his, um, 
his cover, so to speak, and they're stacked. There's a guy behind him with his hand on his shoulder. There's a guy behind him with his hand on his uh, on that guy's shoulder. And off to their left, there's a series of U-Haul trucks. And emerging from the U-Haul trucks is a white pickup truck. So now it's off to their left, so it would be off to the gunman's right. So what they have to do is they, they've discovered now that there was an opening somewhere or this car was parked and they're trying to, it's trying to leave the parking lot and it doesn't know, you know, the driver doesn't know what's going on. They shine their flashlight at the truck to get the driver's attention and they're yelling, stop, stop, stop. So don't come around the corner because you'll be confronted face to face with a gunman. Unfortunately, he'd been a little bit, he got a little bit too far before he realized what was going on before he, he could stop. So this is again, is the um i i just i I can't imagine they're begging and pleading this guy they may think that they're making progress whatever happens and then this happens and it just sends the whole thing into a tailspin back up back up your car back it up he's he's pointing his gun at that citizen he's pointing his gun so you don't see what happened but just that fast uh, somebody in the back gives the the warning. He's pointing his gun at that citizen. Now let's. We've talked about this many a time on the show. Um, the imminent threat of death or great bodily harm to yourself or someone else is uh, the criteria for deadly force, and that's exactly what we have here. The officers aren't necessarily concerned about their lives at this point. They're holding deadly force on the guy. They're negotiating with him in an effort to try to keep him alive. He forces their hand by pointing the gun at the driver of the car that inadvertently slipped into the scene and they had to shoot him. So um, you'll see, if you're watching this, you'll see like very clearly uh, they'll denote. Stay in the car. You can see very clearly circled in yellow here. The gunman is now pointing his gun at the white pickup truck. And then um, they'll pan over in a second and they'll show the white pickup truck, and you can very clearly see that the driver is just not is exposed. So they're trying to demonstrate here, like this guy was in danger. He, whether he could hear our commands or not, he was in danger, and he didn't realize it. Yeah, it's tragic that uh, a situation like that. You know, when you when you're in negotiations and you're 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 trying to learn about you know all the things that can go wrong. You have it in this in your head that if you learn enough, if you prepare enough, if you become a, a strong enough practitioner of your craft, if you devote yourself to it, you feel like I can control all these variables. And then, you know, look at this. A car just drives through. You know, uh, we, we do we do all this like digesting of like what the hostage negotiations is like. You know, should I have a third party intermediary talk to this person? Is it helpful to talk to the family? What is it that's upsetting them? What is it that's helping them feel better? What, you know? what what has helped them in the past and so you go through like this like almost you know psychological surgery on a person and then it doesn't matter because a car drives through because you just you can't control everything like that and it's it's so frustrating and that you know that but conceivably they they could have held out for uh, you know however many more minutes or longer or hours hours indefinitely that there's some kind of hope there that they can maybe resolve it maybe the guy will get tired and just put his hands down and they can go get him anything you know but a car drives through and now so all these poor officers that had to do this you know they've got all this what if and of course the the tactical backlash or the you know the monday morning where you look at the film and you're like well why didn't we have a solid perimeter here or why didn't we check to make sure this was empty or whatever and you know, I, I don't want to even necessarily get into that, but it's just, it doesn't help with uh, feelings of, you know, guilt and remorse. And, you know, right. the, the, this guy that they're trying to talk to that they can't develop a connection with at all, they're feeling connected to him. Okay. They're trauma bonding with him right now because they're like, oh my gosh, I went to high school with that guy. They're uh, trying that, to save his life. I mean, that guy. Yeah. We're trying to can. save his life. I played football with him. So even though that, that the, the attempt to bond with him isn't affecting him, it is affecting those officers. And ultimately, when they have to pull the trigger to save that citizen, it feels like a failure, number one, like because they had to do that, like they had to, they had to protect that guy. In, in a sense, it's a success because they've been, they preserved as much life as possible, right? It wasn't that the citizen died and then the suspect died or, and an officer died, okay? They, they, they minimized loss of life to the extent that they could. Uh, 
but you know they're going to feel guilty about it even though tactically speaking it's it's some degree of a win because they were able to minimize that and it's it's just you know preservation of life is their is their number one goal and it'll still feel like a loss to those guys and I, i feel bad for them yeah i feel horrible for those guys um and i feel horrible for the guy that was just so despondent that he kind of forced their hand i mean um, well, it, that's a, it's important that you say force their hand because this is just, you know, like we discussed with the Najee Seabrooks case, when someone is, they've barricaded themselves or taken themselves hostage in this case or someone else, they are in charge. The police are not in charge. The reason why the police are negotiating is because that is a special tactic when traditional tactics to resolve a, a criminal or other situation have failed. Okay, so this is literally a SWAT tactic. It's a special tactic to talk to someone because traditional police tactics to secure this scene and this suspect and to end the situation peaceably and quickly are not working, right? So the suspect is in charge the entire time. They're trying to regain that control so that they can take him into custody peacefully. But then the suspect takes his control over the situation and uses the force available to him, the deadly force available to him, and says, I'm going to get, send it to this innocent person, this third party. That's when they have to assume control through the use of their own deadly force. Drew, go ahead. Um, I, I think that just about covers it. It's just, uh, the, the, in closing, I, I want to give credit where credit is due. We pulled this from the Stockton Police Department uh, YouTube channel. It is, with all officer-involved critical incidents, uh, the following type of investigations are Currently active, it says uh, it's a multi-agency critical incident investigation and an internal departmental use of force review. I'm, I'm sure it's been concluded at, at this point. I, I don't know factually, but I would think that it's been concluded by now. Um, and so um, just as a general thought uh, to kind of close things a little bit, um, this would be a great opportunity to have a debrief with everybody involved and include those dispatchers because just for the reasons I mentioned a minute ago, it's not necessarily that they were in the middle of the danger, but their heart, they aged two years, just like the officers aged two years that night. And, um, you know, I, I can't stress enough uh, how important I think that is to include um, your uh, dispatchers in these, uh, in these situations, in these uh, uh what am I trying to say, John? The debriefs. As well. Yeah, to get them involved because they, they went through something too. And, you know, the police officers, you know, they go through their own thing because, you know, they're the ones that had to pull the trigger. They were on scene. They're the ones who had to talk to the guy. But, you know, the dispatchers gathering that information, trying to get, get help out there, but ultimately being helpless themselves. You know, I think it was uh, maybe Carly or Amanda or another dispatcher who said, you know, ultimately you've got to rely on those guys. You've got to trust them. You say, I've got this problem. I'm going to send you to it, which is another form of, of stress and possibly trauma when you're sending someone you know, someone you work with, possibly a friend, someone you care about, you're sending them into danger. You say, I have to give this over to you to resolve it because I cannot go do this myself. And that's because I need to be here in this chair to do my job. And what my job is, is important and it can't be fulfilled by someone else. So you have to trust someone else to go take care of that. And by the way, during this entire standoff, uh, there's an EMS unit parked nearby. There's other units there. And they're worried that a police officer is going to get shot. And so they are sitting there waiting, like kind of what you said earlier with the tension building. They're just waiting for some kind of terrible radio code to come over, uh, you know, uh, uh, shots fired, officer down, something like that. They're they're in a cold sweat that entire time that that is going on. They uh, don't but, want the suspect to get shot, but they're worried about their officers too. Drew, go ahead. Right. And then they, they can audibly hear gunshots. I mean, that's what's your instinct at that point? Like, do you run into you? Um, so let's end it on this. I, I just want to kind of cover this real quickly. It's nothing that I'm, but th- there is this, uh, thing that's pushed by, uh, the mental health as- as association. It's called QPR question, per- persuade and refer it's suicide prevention training, but QPR is just like CPR. It's, it's easy to remember, but QPR stands for question, pers- persuade and refer. If you're encountering somebody on the job or you're encountering somebody in your living room uh, or your bedroom uh, or you get a phone call from your uh, significant other or whatever and they're not feeling right, uh, obviously then is the time to ask questions as in, do you feel like you're going to kill yourself? 
Do you feel yes. like you're going to harm yourself? Ask and that I, question. You are never going to incept the idea of suicide into another person. You, they're not no. going to be. They're not going to be in danger. And then you say to them, "Are you thinking about killing yourself?" And then you'd be like, "Well, that's just the right idea for me. That's something that I'm thinking." Yeah, about like, too. oh yeah, I wasn't thinking about that until now. You, Thank you, John. You you can take the pressure off of that situation, and you can diffuse a lot of the roadblocks to that conversation by just simply opening the door. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you thinking about committing suicide? If you, you know, and particularly if you just ask them, you, if you, if, if they don't give you an answer that's satisfactory or maybe it's a little bit withdrawn or held back or something like that's a huge indicator to what's going on with them. And I'm not saying like, try to like psych out your friends or whatever, but just attack the heart of the issue, particularly when their life is so important. There's no reason to beat around the bush about it. And if they're not thinking about that, they're going to tell you like, no, no, it hasn't got to that point. I'm fine. You know, but if it has, then it needs to get discussed right then. Drew, go ahead. But there's no shame in this. So like everybody's always saying that, you know, they're just like nothing drives me more crazy in teaching interviews and interrogations when I learn that the officer that I'm teaching doesn't want to offend somebody by calling them a liar, but they know they're lying. So why don't you just call them a liar? It's okay. Like if they complain on you for and you've caught them in a lie, you're okay. You're not going to offend anybody. So questioning somebody who is suicidal is not offensive. You're just being blatant. You're being the leader at that point. And you're saying, are you feeling like you're going to kill yourself? Because I, I need to help you. I need to, I need to get there to you, or we need to do something to kind of get you off this path. So question, persuade them to seek yeah. some type of, uh, of mental health, but refer and, and make sure you follow up with it. And it's the, the burden is definitely not on you. It's, no. If you are going to help though, I mean, if you, if, if you feel the need or uh, this is just simply a, a manner or a mechanism of handling somebody who, who is suicidal. And again, knowing three numbers, nine, eight, eight, knowing 211, knowing uh, getting on your radio and calling or, or uh, dialing 911 in your cell phone and talking out loud saying, I don't, I don't know why you want to kill yourself. You yeah. know, just get somebody's attention to help you kind of, you know, talk that guy off the ledge like our first guy. So, you know, just to wrap it up with a, with a neat little bow, uh, um, you know, the first guy is no different than the, the, the last guy. Right. The first guy that we, we saw in the video tonight, he's no different than the, the guy who just got to the point where it, it had bowled over. The, the, this guy is just trying to get right and he's trying to get things fixed. And it's one roadblock after another. And it's just so frustrating to have to relive the atrocities that they've already lived or they've already had to explain it to two or three people or you've already got a good groove going with somebody. And now you got to try to explain it again. So. I don't know what the solution is as far as the VA is concerned. Stay involved, though. Uh, be supportive as a family member. Be supportive as uh, as a as a partner, uh, whether you're in uh, law enforcement or firefighter or dispatch, whatever. Just just be there. If if your veteran friends are are telling you things, if they're giving you things like, "Man, this is not working," or "This is you know, I'm stressed out about this," or "I can't seem to get care," like. Talk to that person. Don't disregard those those little tips that that stuff's going wrong. You know, it's like Drew said, it's not on you to fix it. You're not morally responsible for getting them out of that situation. But be a good friend to them. Like talk to them. And you know, we talk about you know how you we can refer you to nine eight eight nine one one and uh, you know question and all this stuff. That's all good stuff. Most you know a lot of people who are are out there and they're seeking professional help which is a good thing. How many of them need that? But also what they really need is a friend who just shows up and shuts up and listens. Be somebody in that person's life where you say, you know, um, how can I best support you right now? And don't say anything. What's working for you right now? What's not working for you right now? Uh, and whatever they, whatever they tell you, just listen and just don't try to interject. Don't try to, don't try to silver line things. Well, like, well, at least, you know, you still have your health or, uh, and, and don't, don't trick them with false empathy. Like, Hey man, I know what you're going through. Cause one time I went through this. No, just that's, listen. That, that's the just wrong path. Listen. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I think it's uh, just been a heavy night. It's kind of time to wrap it up. Listen, if, uh, if you ever need anything from any of us, obviously give us a call. Uh, yeah. if you want to leave us a voicemail until the next show we have, it's, uh, eight, eight, four, eight, two, six, 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 nine, 11 nice that's 848 calm 911 all right until next time john 
stick, stick around. around. Take care of each other, everybody. Reach out if you need us, and we'll uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>